question is Krashen's five hypotheses. This falls under interactionist school of thought. Okay? Although it borrows a lot from, from initism. So Stephen Krashen has been a professor for a long time. His first hypothesis is acquisition learning distinction. That language acquisition is different from language learning. He makes a difference between language acquisition and language learning. Although in general, we don't use that terminology. We use language learning for all kinds of language acquisition. We, we use them interchangeably. But for Stephen Krashen, learning is like the one on the left, the picture on the left, where you learn the rules, you learn the grammar. There's explicit learning. Acquisition, on the other hand, is like the, the one on the right. You don't try to learn the rules, you learn to communicate. Another analogy would be learning history versus learning to ride a bike. When you learn history, you learn it explicitly. You learn the terms, you learn the content by explicitly consciously learning them on the other hand when you learn to ride a bike you learn it you you don't really learn it you acquire it you acquire learning a bike there's no textbook for learn, learning to ride a bike you acquire it and once you have acquired it you have it for the rest of your life so acquisition is a process similar to the way young children learn their first language there's no rules. It's all about communication. The focus is on communication. Acquisition is subconscious. Learners are not aware that they are acquiring language, but are using it for communication. Okay. I realize I don't need to to send the PowerPoint to you because we already have a recording. It's the recording that I will send to you. So acquisition is implicit learning. It's informal learning and natural learning. It's like picking up a language. When you stay for a long time in a particular place, you will probably learn the language unless you are not really motivated, you don't want to learn the language. Now, adults can also acquire. This, this ability does not end at puberty, but it does not mean that adults will always achieve native-like fluency. So, According to Krashen, adults can also access the language acquisition device. It's inside the universal grammar. It's a separate faculty for learning a language, okay? We, we learned in, when we discussed Inetism that Inetism teaches that there is a separate faculty, separate, separate, separate part of the language, all of the brain for learning a language apart from the faculties that we use for learning math and uh, memorizing word, memorizing uh, terms, it's different. Now, uh, Stephen Krashen believes that error correction has little effect on acquisition. When you com when you correct the grammar form, then it has little effect on acquisition. Brown and his colleagues found that parents actually correct only a small portion of children's language. And these are occasional pronunciation problems, certain verbs, and 
dirty words. Parents attend far more to the truth value of what the child is saying rather than to the form. It's the truth value if, 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 the, if what they're saying is factually accurate or not. So her curl my hair when in fact uh, the hair is too short. Okay. So the child would ask somebody to have to curl her hair, but it's not possible because her hair is still a little too short. Now, I don't know why, why my PowerPoint became faulty. Let me correct this. So, for example, a child would say, Walt Disney comes on on Tuesdays. Lumalabas sa TV ng Tuesday. No, honey. Walt Disney comes on on Wednesdays. So, yung truth value lang yung kinokorek nila. They just correct the truth value. Not the form. Not the grammar. On the other hand, learning is conscious knowledge of rules. It's knowing about, it's explicit learning the rules. And in learning the rules, error correction supposedly has an effect. So conscious learning of the rules has an effect for, for, for language learning. And we will find out that language learning is beneficial only for the monitor later on. Language learning is beneficial. Ah, yes, learning, language learning in contrast to acquisition is beneficial only for monitoring. Okay, for example, he has a car. Hasn't he or doesn't he? Well, the word has here is not an auxiliary verb it's a synonym for own he owns a car doesn't he that's why you don't use hasn't he okay so this is explicit teaching of rules this is language learning according to Krashen. not language acquisition Krashen's second hypothesis is the natural order that there is a natural order in acquiring language. Acquisition of grammatical structures proceeds in a predictable order, predictable and natural order. The analogy of this would be the life cycle of a butterfly, the stages in a butterfly. A butterfly starts out as an egg, then it becomes a caterpillar, then it becomes a pupa and then later on it becomes a butterfly there's a life cycle there's metamorphosis there are stages so language is compared to being an organism language is like an organism in the sense that it goes through stages the errors that uh, a language learner commits are related to the stage of language learning he is in, he or she is in. Okay, so the grammatical forms acquired and the errors acquired, uh, produced, they relate to a particular stage. Not all errors are, of course, uh, related to developmental stages, but there are many what of what are called developmental errors. Errors related to the development of a child. Errors related to the stage in which a language learner is in. Okay. According to Krashen, acquirers of a given language tend to acquire certain grammatical structures early and others later. <clears throat> 
Okay. So, for example, in the first stage, a language learner acquires case, subject and object. Related to that, a language learner learns the word order of a particular language. Then on stage two, a language learner would learn the singular cop copula, which is is, and the plural auxiliary are, like are eating. Singular copula, he is mad, okay? The language learner also learns the progressive in. At the third stage, the language learner learns the past irregular. Notice the irregular is learned first before the regular. Then the, at this stage, the language learner also acquires possessive, apostrophe S, the third person singular, is, hindi pala is, the S for like, for example, he, he eats bread. Okay, that's third person singular. Then, the language learner also learns the modal wood and the long plural S. He teaches. And then in the fourth stage, the language learner learns the modal have and the N. Okay, this is according to research by Dooley and Burke in 1975. So crash and built on this. According to crash and the agreement among individual acquirers is not always 100%, but there are clear statistically significant similarities. So when you apply statistical methods, you would see that there are similarities between the language, the language features of language learners, no matter what first language they have. So all language learners learning English, you can group them together at what stage they are based on the statistically significant similarities that they have. Okay, so it goes without saying that Stephen Krashen's theory is based on a lot of data. His third hypothesis is the mind monitor hypothesis. This is where you correct your sentence. This is when you focus on the form. Okay, you learn something, you learn the rules, and those rules are on top of your acquired competence, the one inside you, the one that you have already internalized. You apply the, the rules that you learn when you pay attention to the form that produces better grammatical, core, uh, grammatical sentences. So you monitor your form. There are people who monitor their, the form of their language. And this is where the rules acquire rules learned explicitly can be useful. So my example is myself. When I when I focus on the form, I am able to produce correct tag questions. But if I focus on the message, I find that my tag questions are all wrong. So I have realized that I have not really acquired, I have not really internalized bad questions. But I am able to produce good sentences with bad questions if I focus on the form. Now the monitor is used only when three conditions are present. First, there is time. You're not in a hurry, you're not in, an, in a need, in a hurry to communicate the message. You have time to correct your sentences. I'm sure 
you have experience saying a sentence and then saying it again when you correct yourself in English. But I'm sure that in when speaking your own language, you don't you don't speak, you don't repeat your sentences for the sake of correctness. When you speak Tagalog for Tagalog speakers, you don't correct your Tagalog. But when you speak English, there are times when you repeat your sentence. That's because you have time. Another is when you're focusing on the form. The monitor is useful only when you explicitly, consciously focus on the form. And if you know the rule, if you don't know the rule, then you cannot really apply the rule consciously. Then this means that the monitor enables speakers to use forms that they have not, they, they are, they, that are not yet acquired, that they have not yet acquired. In my case, as I said, I have not yet acquired tag questions, but I'm able to produce grammatical sentences that have tag questions because I monitor the form of my speech. Okay, Krashen talks about three types of monitor users. The overuser, they may be too exposed to grammar teaching and they are insecure about trusting acquired system. I think uh, according to uh, a resource speaker that we had, an example of these are Japanese. The Japanese, they speak English slowly, trying to focus on producing correct sentences. Then there are under users. They rely completely on a card system. The, according to the same resource speaker, examples of these are Latinos. The Latinos do not focus on grammar. They don't focus on form. They keep talking and talking and talking. They're the other end of the Japanese. And then of course, there are optimal users. Those who only use the monitor only when necessary to produce correct form without impeding communication. So a learner acquires a language through comprehensible input. I keep on telling you that if you get stuck in an island, you have a radio that's tuned in to a Chinese station, even after years of listening, you won't be able to learn Chinese because the input you have is not comprehensible. According to Krashen, a necessary but not sufficient condition to move from stage I to, say, to stage I plus one is that the acquirer understand input that contains I plus one. Okay. The acquirer should be exposed to input that is I plus one, meaning just a little bit beyond his capability. Where the word understand means that the acquirer is focused on the meaning and not the form of the message. So a language learner should be exposed to input that is I plus one, meaning just a little beyond their capability. Now, this is similar to Levygotsky's zone of proximal development. Levygotsky is like Piaget. He, he studies learning, but he emphasizes social learning. That learners benefit a lot more from interaction with more knowledgeable people, like a child and an adult. So Levigotsi's zone of proximal development contains content that is just a little beyond a learner's capability. Now, this content cannot be learned by a learner through practice, but only through aid from a much more knowledgeable person. I think I've already given you the example of my mother. They learn English through books. They rarely watch English movies. Now, in, in English books, there, there's no uh, word for aray. For aray. So my mom and her colleagues were wondering what's the English term for aray. And they invented what they thought would be 
the English word for aray, like aroy. We thought it was aroy. But lucky for us, fortunately for us, we already had Sesame Street. And we encountered the word ouch on Sesame Street. So we know that. And we would not have known that had we not had interaction with a much learner, learned person. And that is Sesame Street, the, the people on Sesame Street. Okay, so there are forms that are just beyond the capability of a person. And even if a person, a language learner, practices a lot, he will not acquire that those forms. He needs somebody to teach him those forms. Okay, now according to the behaviorist view, you should first produce the structure, then you practice. But in the input hypothesis, you go for meaning to acquire structure. You don't go for structure. You go for meaning. Now, uh, you would notice that this is a little bit counterintuitive. As I told you, so many things in language learning, in second language acquisition, in our topic, are counterintuitive. Okay, let's have our statement of the input hypothesis. The input hypothesis relates to acquisition, not learning. Unlike the monitor hypothesis, which relates to learning, to conscious learning, the input hypothesis, which is the heart of Krashen's uh, theory, it relates to acquisition, subconscious learning of the grammar. And we acquire by understanding language that contains structure a bit beyond our current level of competence. This is done with the help of context or extra linguistic information. For example, later on I will teach you total physical response. When I say Chaba, I will do hand signals. So even though you do not know the word Chaba, which is Burmese, through my through my hand signals, you would have an idea of what it is. Okay? So that will be for TPR. According to the input hypothesis, input must contain I plus one to be useful for language acquisition, but it need not contain only I plus one. So it's okay even if the language being spoken to a child or to a language learner contains not only I plus one. But the input, the language to which a person is exposed to must contain I plus one. But not only I plus one. Not necessarily I plus one. And yet, if the acquirer understands the input and there is enough of it, then I plus one will be automatically provided. So as long as the learner is able to understand the input, then the I plus one will be automatically provided. In other words, if communication is successful, I plus one is provided. This implies that the best input should not even attempt to deliberately aim at I plus one. So Krashen emphasizes that even though the kind of input that a learner needs is I plus one, it doesn't mean that the teacher should attempt to deliberately aim at I plus one, rather approximately I plus one. A deliberate attempt to provide I plus one is not necessary, and there is even reason to suspect that a, a deliberate attempt is detrimental. It's not good to try to attempt to provide I plus one. Because speaking fluency cannot be taught directly, rather it emerges over time on its own. Accuracy develops over time as the acquirer hears and understands more input. By the way, this input here includes 
the sentences produced by the same language learner through monitoring. So when you monitor your speech, you apply the grammar that you learn, the grammar rule that you learn, you produce correct sentences, and those correct sentences serve as comprehensible input. Okay? So you monitor the form of your grammar, of your speech, through the rules that were explicitly taught to you. And then when you produce those grammatically well-formed sentences, those grammatically well-formed sentences that you produce can serve as comprehensible input for you. So, which means that learning grammatical rules explicitly still has a lot of benefit because they help you produce comp comprehensible input okay, from yourself. Production ability emerges. It is not taught directly. It's up to the person to learn to speak properly. You cannot really teach it directly because of the so many things that we have learned a while ago. Okay, let's talk about a little, some of the evidences for the input hypothesis. One relates to first language acquisition in children. Mother ease or caretaker speech aims to be comprehensible. Mother ease is not a deliberate attempt to teach language. The language spoken by the mother it's not a deliberate attempt to teach language. Researchers have found that motherese is a simplified form of language, but it's not a deliberate attempt to teach language. Motherese is roughly tuned. It's not finely tuned for I plus one. And mother ease tends to get more complex as the child progresses. You as a caretaker, the, the language that you speak to, to a child becomes more complex as the child progresses. In other words, caretakers do not provide a grammatically based syllabus. Caretaker speech, not just a mother, is similar to a mother's speech. Okay. Rough tuning, not fine tuning, has the following advantages in a child's first language acquisition. First, rough tuning ensures that I plus one is covered with no guesswork as to just what I plus one is for each child. On the other hand, the lip, on the other hand, deliberate aim at I plus one might miss. So it's so much better to provide approximately I plus one, roughly I plus one, instead of deliberately aiming at I plus one, because it might miss. Number two, approximately I plus one or roughly tuned input will provide I plus one for more than one child at a time, as long as they understand what is said. Finely tuned input, even if accurate, even if it hits I plus one, will only benefit the child whose I plus one is exactly the same as what is emphasized in the input. If you provide I plus one, it will benefit only one child. That's why don't worry about trying to provide I plus one. You just provide approximately I plus one, roughly tuned input, not finely tuned input. And three, roughly tuned input provides built-in review. Okay, it provides built-in review. We need not be concerned with whether a child has mastered a structure, whether the child was paying attention to the input that day, or whether we provided enough. With natural roughly tuned input, I plus one will occur and reoccur. So you don't need to think, was he paying attention? 
did we provide enough? But if you just provide roughly tuned input, I plus one will be found. Will be, will be found in the input. And it will occur and reoccur. Okay, here's some evidence from second language acquisitions from simple codes. First, we have foreigner talk. In foreigner talk, language native speakers adjust their communication and there is a lot of clarification or what is called negotiation of meaning. Then there's also teacher talk. When the teacher tries to provide input and the input of the teacher usually comes in the form similar to what children hear from their parents, which are imperatives, commands. Interlanguage talk, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so Krashen has a case against the grammatical syllabus. When we say grammatical syllabus, you have topics for each, for each um, session. Okay, class today, we'll talk about the regular past tense. Class, in order to produce the regular past tense, you need ED. You put ED. Okay. Now, the problem with that kind of grammatical syllabus is you provide it only once. Unlike when you provide comprehensible input. Actually, uh, Krashen's theory is very popular because it has immediate classroom implications. And one of them is that the classroom should provide a lot of comprehensible input in contrast to a grammatical syllabus. Okay, all students may not be at the same stage. The structure of the day may not be I plus one for all students. So some students are not privileged. They're disadvantaged because it's not their I plus one. However, with natural communicative input, on the other hand, some I plus one or other will be provided for everyone. So you just provide natural input instead of a grammatically fine-tuned syllabus. With a grammatical syllabus, each, each structure is provided only once. Finally, a grammatical syllabus and the resulting grammatical focus places serious constraints on what can be discussed. You're discussing only a few things. You're focusing only on the form. And, but there are so many forms which we may not be covered by your grammatical syllabus. But if you provide comprehensible input, roughly tuned I plus one, then you are able to produce comprehensible input. According to Krashen, if these arguments are correct, they mean that we should not attempt to teach along the natural order or any other order when our goal is acquisition. Notice that it's once again counterintuitive. Krashen teaches that there is a natural order for language, but he cautions against teaching using, trying to follow the natural order. He's, he also believes in comprehensible input, but he doesn't prescribe trying to fine tune your input to provide I plus one. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. His, Theory is counterintuitive, but it's based on data. There's evidence from second language acquisition, the silent period, and first language in influence. The child in natural language learning, language acquisition, goes through a silent period. But that silent period in which the child doesn't talk in the target language is a time for the child to interpret the, in, 
the input that he has. If you're a teacher, you would listen to a child trying to learn a language, you would realize that the child is actually processing the input. He may be trying to repeat what somebody said, or he might be trying to think about what is being said. So you would notice that the silent period is actually a time for the child to acquire language. On the other hand, classroom teaching of language does not allow for a silent period. Because in grammar, when in grammar based syllabus, you have to keep on producing and producing. And sometimes the child doesn't really process the input. Then there is first language influence. So when a child needs to say something in I plus one, but he could not say it because it's a little bit beyond his competence, what he does is he relies on the first language to bridge that gap in order to facilitate communication. So the L1 has a little bit of help, at least in the short term. The last hypothesis of crashing is the affective filter. Now the word affective is just a fancy word for emotional. So if you want to sound sophisticated, use the term affective instead of the word emotional. When we say affective filter, it's just a fancy way of saying there's an emotional problem in the child that prevents him from learning. And you as a teacher, you, you're probably very familiar with this. And this not, this not only applies to language learning. This applies to all kinds of learning. If a child is bothered by something, he will not be able to focus on learning. So this is very, this one is very, very uh, intuitive, very logical, okay? So according to Krasha, this is, a, this is a fancy way of saying it. When the affective filter is, filter is up, the input does not go to the language acquisition device. The input doesn't go to the language acquisition device. The language acquisition device needs input in order for it to produce what is called acquired competence, which is what you know about language, what you have learned about language. When, when there's emotional problem in the brain, that emotional problem prevents the input from reaching the language acquisition device. That is the affective filter it's up when it's down when the affective filter is down then the input is able to come in to the brain to the language acquisition device which is inside the universal grammar which is the separate faculty for learning a language and because of that the language acquisition device is able to process the input and it helps produce acquired competence. Okay, so the affective filter keeps the input from reaching the language acquisition device. Now, there are three categories of affective variables, emotional variables. One of them is motivation. If you are motivated to learn the language, then the affective filter is low it's down but when you're not motivated it's a little bit up okay there are four kinds there are four kinds divided into two of kinds of motivation there's intrinsic extrinsic motivation extrinsic motivation refers to what you get from the environment like when somebody tries to to force you to learn a language, to pressure you. The other one is intrinsic motivation. You want to, simply because you want to. A classic example for me of uh, extrinsic motivation would be Koreans. Why is it that when Korean students, when they are in Korea, 
they study well. But when they go out of Korea into other countries, they end up being lazy. I think it's because of the societal pressure, extrinsic motivation. They don't have intrinsic motivation. Another motiva kind of motivation is functional versus integrative. Now you can mix those four. Intrinsic, functional motivation. Like you really want to learn a language because you want to be able to preach the gospel to a particular country. So when you have functional motivation, you have a reason, a specific reason for a specific use for learning the language. On the other hand, when you have integrative motivation, you want to become part of the speech, the speech community. And you can mix that with extrinsic motivation. For example, extrinsic Integrative motivation means that somebody is pressuring you to become part of the community. Okay. Then another one is self-confidence. When you don't have self-confidence, it serves as an effective filter that prevents input from coming, from going into the language acquisition device. On the other hand, if you have a lot of self-confidence, you would be able to lower the effective filter, allowing the input to go into your acquisition device. Finally, you have anxiety. When you're pressured and you think that maybe you don't, maybe there's a lot of pressure for you. If you're really pressured, then probably you will not learn. But you have a little bit of anxiety that could serve as a way of lowering the effective filter. Okay, so how, what are the implications of this in teaching? Well, the classroom should be a source of comprehensible input, especially if it is not available outside. So this is especially true in EFL classes. In EFL classes, there's no input available outside. English as a foreign language, as opposed to English as a second language, which in which there is a lot of input coming from outside the classroom. The classroom should be a source of comprehensible input. The classroom also should not should be a non-threatening environment to conducive to learning. Otherwise, if it's if it's a threatening environment, then the effective filter will be up preventing input from going into the language acquisition device. Okay. So those are the five hypotheses of crashing regarding language learning. And it's very, very uh, popular. 